Howdy y'all. So we're picking up with a mini lecture on female conquistadors. So you should have been reading about the settlement of the New World, primarily initially by Spain. Now these female conquistadors, we've talked about conquistadors and read about them, so these are the female ones. And we think typically women didn't take this role, but there were some significant ones that prove that women are there. It may not be the main narrative that we have typically been told, but women are there in a lot of different capacities. So the first two major conquistadors accompanied Hernan Cortes. So this is the guy that stowed away and eventually made his way to Mexico after seizing a ship that he wasn't supposed to be on. Landed in what becomes Mexico. So this is the area of the Aztec Empire and eventually conquers the Aztecs. Now, this woman, La Malinche, so this is her Indian name. So she goes by several other names, Malinali, Malintzin, and in Spanish, Doña Marina. So she has gotten kind of a mixed rap over the years. So initially she was seen as kind of a betrayer of the Native Americans, of the Aztecs, because she was uh, not an Aztec, but she was one of the slaves of the Aztecs. And basically she had had some interactions with Spanish uh, castaways that had been shipwrecked and landed on the Mexican coast. So she knew a little bit of Spanish. So when Cortez landed, she proved to be an excellent kind of intermediary, a translator for Cortez. And she will go with Cortez all the way from the coast, all the way to Tenochtitlan, and eventually even become kind of his wife, bear his children, all this kind of stuff. So while initially, like in early histories of Mexico, she's seen as kind of this betrayal of the Mexican people. In more recent history, she is kind of seen as the mother of modern Mexico because between her and Cortez, the half Native American, half European, half Spanish child and children they had, which are called mestizo, so a half Native American, half white European, are kind of the first of what become the modern Mexican people. So it's kind of this mixed story, but she was right there beside him in the whole conquest of Mexico. Now, there was another woman that traveled from Spain with Cortez. So she helped capture Tenochtitlan, like we talked about. But Maria de Estrada. Now, Maria was actually fighting alongside Cortez and his men. So she is going to be and crucial to the campaign. She is part of the combined army that eventually captures Tenochtitlan on the second entry into the uh, Aztec capital. Remember the first entry into the Aztec capital? They try to kidnap Montezuma. It goes poorly. They get expelled. Then they rally the forces of all the other Native Americans that the Aztecs had conquered. And this combined army, which she is part of the Spanish contingent, take back the capital. So while different from contemporary kind of belief that it's all men, all Spanish men doing this, there are women acting as women, taking prominent roles, both Spanish women and Native American women. Now, one of the more interesting cases is Isabel Barato de Castro. Now, Isabel is going to be the first woman in European history to hold the title of Admiral. Now, initially, her husband was in charge of the fleet. He dies. She seizes command. And she actually does very, very well. Over time, she'll help explore and settle the Philippines, Mexico, Peru, and uh, settle for a time in Buenos Aires. Now, she was known as kind of a ruthless leader, but as a woman at the time, she had to be a little ruthless. She had to take control with kind of an iron will, otherwise the men may not listen. And we'll talk more about other women that had this kind of struggle at the time period of being these powerful women in an age dominated by men, particularly with Queen Elizabeth of England. But we'll get to her later. Next, we have Ines Suarez. So she is a completely female conquistador, led her own conquests. Uh, she helped explore and conquer Chile, and she fought openly as a woman. So she didn't dress as a man. She, like the ones we've talked about so far, presented themselves as women, fought as women, and just simply were women in this capacity. Now, probably the single most unique and most famous of the female conquistadors 
as Carolina de Arazo, also known by her male name of Francisco Loya. Now, Carolina started as a convent, as a nun in a convent. She hated it, she did not like it, so she cut her hair, her hair very short and ran away one night when the convent was left unlocked. So she escaped disguised as a boy. She travels first in Spain and then eventually gets on a ship, travels to the New World, and begins her exploits in the New World. Very early on, she helps lead and defeat a Dutch pirate fleet. She eventually joins an army dressed as a man. Now, this is what's unique about Catalina or Francisco, is that she portrayed herself as a man. Now, whether she was transgender or not, we don't know. We don't have writings that say what she thought, whether she was dressing as a man because she felt like a man or dressing like a man because it made it easier to do what she wanted. We just aren't clear on this. But nonetheless, she portrayed herself as a man. Uh, she also helped invade, so she joined the Spanish army and helped invade Chile and conquered vast amounts of land from the Native Americans. She rose in rank due to her success, becoming a very prominent officer in the army. Uh, having several expeditions in her own right that she led as a conquistador. And due to her success in battle, many women began, like noble and wealthy women, began proffering her for marriage, wanting to marry into his or her success. Now, she never marries. She doesn't, as far as we know, she doesn't ever take a spouse. But what's interesting about Catalina or Francisco is that when she goes back to Spain, she meets with the Pope, meets with the King, and they basically give her a title and a piece of paper that says, you're no longer a woman, you're a man. For all legal and practical purposes, you're a man. In the eyes of God, you're a man. So this is wild. So we think of the past as kind of this religiously conservative, hardline thing, but you have these stories where this pops out and you have these exceptions to the rule. Now, the way this worked and particularly in Spain this was while well, Spain was rigid in some ways it was very flexible in others particularly with gender race things like that now in regards to race the Spanish created a hierarchical system called las castas so this basically said depending on who your father was who your mother was going on back grandparents great-grandparents that determined your level in society, your level in the caste. So la castas is the caste. Now, the caste system is where you create a hierarchical system of people. It's where you organize people. So at the simplest level, you have kind of mestizos and mulatos. So mestizos are half Native American, half European. In this case, half Spanish. So this would be like Cortez and Malinche's children. Mulatos are half black, half European. And you can kind of see on this, they have dozens and dozens of these hierarchies. Now, what's crazy is just like you had with Francisco or Catalina, she was able to earn her choice as being a man. You can do the same thing in Las Castas. So you might be born mestizo, you're born, born mulato. You can buy or work your way up in the caste system. So in Spanish society, the ideal person is what's called a peninsularis. So this is a European Spaniard born in the Spanish or Iberian peninsula. That's the goal. That's the highest level of society. You know, then you have nobles within that and go on to the king and different things like that. But say you're a Creole, which means you're born in the new world and you're a mestizo Creole. So say your dad was a Spanish conquistador, married an Indian woman, had mestizo children, you're going to be lower rank than a European Spaniard who came over from Spain. But if you're successful, you build enough wealth, you win wars, you win battles, you make a name for yourself, you can petition the crown, so the Spanish crown, Spanish royalty, and they'll basically give you a piece of paper that says, well, you're no longer mestizo. Now you're whatever the next rank up is, or you're full white. And in kind of historical writing, we call this purchasing whiteness, which is a radical, weird idea that you can, that race exists, and it's this whole caste system, but 
that if you have enough money or power or prestige, it doesn't really matter. And this goes to show how artificial race really is. People have made it up, people have created hierarchies, but when it comes down to it, people are more concerned with practical issues and they'll bend the system, bend the rules, if it means personal benefit. So just keep all of this in mind. So that's it for our short little mini lecture on female conquistadors and la castas. So if you have questions, shoot me an email. If you want to learn more about this, you can go places like Wikipedia. If you search Wikipedia for all the different women's names, it'll pull up a lot of good information, a lot more detail than we went into today. But we'll stop there for today, and we'll pick up with our next lecture next week. I will see you all later.